and welcome back to Baldy Cats. Now, if you were to ask me what my favourite area of science was, I would absolutely 100% have to say it's the area of quantum physics. Some of the experiments in that field really fill me with wonder. Now, in contrast, some of YouTube's flat earth experiments also really make me wonder, just not perhaps in the same way. So I thought it would be a really good idea today if I was to get some help from the conspiracy cat. Hello. And together we're going to look at three of my favourite quantum physics experiments and just for the heck of it we're going to compare each one with one of YouTube's finest flat earth related videos. Let's start with the double slit experiment. Take it away cat. Okay get some equipment like this and then boom put a bulb in it yeah you weren't expecting that. Just remember that not any bulb will do it'll have to be what we call a coherent light source that's where all the photons are good mates and go up and down together at the same time. Now, the bulb gives off light, and the light looks like this. It's got a wavelength that spreads out. But when the light goes through the gaps, these are acting now as two separate sources of light. And because light is a wave, they will combine on the screen to make an interference pattern. That is when uh, two waves can constructively interfere to make something that's brighter, or destructively interfere to make something that's darker. It's amazing. And only waves do it. Therefore, light is acting as a wave, and that's the end of the story. Boom, only kidding, it's not really. So, I can do the same thing with bigger objects. Let's say I take some sand and I pour some sand through the holes. Well, sand isn't a wave, is it? So I just get these two areas of sand there. That's not surprising, is it? I'll tell you what else isn't surprising. Watch, boom, I can close one of those slits and now I can use something smaller. I can use atoms and I've put them through and they just act like particles and give me one fringe as well. And I bet you're wondering now, when's it going to get interesting? Well, watch this. Kazoom! I'm going to open up the second slit and I'm still going to fire the atoms through but look now they're acting like a wave you didn't see that coming did you maybe it's because i'm pulling them all through at once and they're repelling each other so what if i fired them one at a time well boom they still act as a wave unbelievable so are these atoms trying to be cheeky or what i'm going to find out by putting a camera there and you know what happens when i put a camera watching the slits oh they decide not to act as a wave anymore and they decide to act like the sand cheeky buggers so then I get a little bit fed up with them and I turn off my camera and as soon as I turn off my camera, boom, they act like a wave again. Oh, I don't know what's going on. Thanks, Kat. So, essentially, the double slit experiment tells us that something like an electron, for example, can start off as a particle at point A and it can end as a particle at point B. But in between point A and B, it exists as a wave of almost infinite possibilities. Now, this is mind-blowing and at A level we teach... Uh, Richard Feynman's sum of paths uh, solution to this, although there are many other solutions uh, out there such as the many worlds explanation which is not as ridiculous as it sounds. Now this isn't a video yet to put those explanations in. What I have done for each of these quantum physics experiments is I've linked you to the PBS space time uh, or an equally good video explanation below and I highly recommend you check them all out. However, Richard Feynman once said that if you understood the double slit experiment fully you understood quantum physics fully. And there's only one man in the world that can do that. And that is flat earth YouTuber, Quantum Eraser. He also said that nobody understands quantum mechanics. What? I, I understand this double slit experiment. I, I showed this to my daughter five years ago when she was 10. Took her about 15, 20 minutes. She got it. You do understand how silly you sounded though, yeah? For fuck's sake, man! So the double slit experiment really opens the door for us to ask more and more questions and dig deeper and deeper, gaining more and more knowledge about how the universe works. Now let's contrast that with a flat earth related experiment. This guy's called Jerry and he's about to show us that the moon gives off cold light. Now I wonder if he'll even think about digging deeper and asking questions once he gets his first set of results. Let's find out. Hello, my name is Jerry Rogers. Are you sure it's not Chris Kringle? I'm a little podunk town south of here called, or north of here called Shallow Water. Don't care. And we're going to do a moonlight test. Oh, sounds like fun. Let's get cracking, then we can finish before Christmas. The moonlight currently in the shade, I'm going to get a recording of somewhere around 40 degrees. Okay, so the black rubber mat is 40 degrees. Got ya. Now what? And then we go over here to the moon light full on, and we've got 32.5, 33, somewhere right in that area. Oh, so the concrete floor isn't as warm then. Well, that blows my mind. And then go right back over here, <laughs> around the 40. 
Uh, excuse me, can I just interrupt you for a little while? Um, have you ever heard of something called radiated cooling or specific heat capacity? Maybe you want to investigate those, or are you just going to laugh and come to a stupid conclusion? <laughs> Oh, I thought you might. So as predicted, after the flat earth related experiment, no further questions were asked and no further avenues of investigation were followed. Unlike with the double slit experiment, where after trying to figure out what was going on, the experiment was modified into what I think is my favorite investigation of the three I'm gonna show you today, the quantum eraser experiment. Take it away, Cap. Okay, for this experiment, you still need your double slit. There it is. Look, you need your laser and you need your screen for the interference pattern to fall on. But that's not all, because are you ready? Shazam! We need a funky crystal like this. And why do we need a crystal like that, here you ask? Well, don't be so impatient. So the reason we got a crystal is because when a photon hits a crystal, it splits into two photons. Would you believe it? And these photons are what we call uh, entangled pairs. And what that means is basically like the best mates, the Snapchat and the email all the time. Now, it's well important to remember, like proper important to remember, that no matter what slit you go through, you're going to go through the crystal and you're going to split into best buddy photon pairs. All right, what I want you to see now, when this photon goes through here, you've got to pay attention. It's gone through the right-hand slit, and watch what happens when it goes through the crystal and splits into best buddy photon pairs. Can you see what, what I'm trying to show you? Can you see? Let's find out. Boo! Did I scare you? Yeah, I bet I did, yeah. <laughs> anyway, what I was trying to show you was the photon that went to the detector didn't arrive at the detector until after the photon that went to the screen went to the screen. That's really important. So the one that went to the screen will either have behaved as a wave or a particle before the other one got to the detector. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's what I was trying to say. And it's the same if it goes through the left-hand side slit. You see, even on the left-hand side slit, it gets to the screen before its best buddy photon mate gets to the detector. So what that means is we either see an interference pattern and wave behavior on the screen, or we see particle-like behaviour on the screen before the best buddy mate gets to the detector. Easy peasy. Ah, me again, only kidding. It's not easy peasy at all. In fact, it gets about as crazy as a flat earther in a science lecture. And that's because we've actually got two different detectors that the photons might hit, but it will always hit them after the first ones hit the screen. But anyway, one of the detectors will actually look at the slit and tell us which one of the slits that the photon, the original photon, actually went through. That's what the first detector does. The second detector they might hit can't do that. It's not capable of finding out which slit the photons went through. So get ready to have your mind blown. If the photons get to the detector that can't detect which slit they went through, we get an interference pattern, yeah. So they behave like a wave. But can you guess what happens if the best buddy photon mate gets to the detector that can detect what slit the original photon went through? Oh yeah, we get something that resembles particle-like behaviour. Oh, these cheeky photons are really, really cheesing me off. Hello, homies. Me again, one time. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is whether we get particle-like behaviour or wave-like behaviour on the screen seems to be like time travel and Doctor Who because it's decided by the best buddy photon mate which doesn't get to the detector till after the first one hits the screen. Oh, so confusing. And there you have it. The quantum eraser experiment really blows my mind. Now, I don't really know what else to say about that other than to advise you to check out the link to the PBS Space Time video on it in the description. But for now, let's turn our sights to another amazing YouTube flat earth scientist. This time we turn to Dee Marble, who wasn't happy when Neil deGrasse Tyson dropped the microphone to prove gravity. And this is his response. Today we're going to talk about gravity. What is it? Where does it come from? Oh, amazing. Do you understand gravity then and how it works? I don't understand gravity, how it works. I don't understand science. I don't understand physics. Well, blow me down and colour me surprised. What the hell was that all about then? Oh, don't jump, son. It's not worth it. Oh, that's a relief. What's he trying to prove here then? It's interesting how they fall downwards every time, isn't it? Uh, no, don't jump! No! Oh! God, that was lucky. No, Neil. That's called density. It's called bollocks! Now, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, 
Where is the follow-up question to that? Why aren't we asking, why do those objects fall downwards? Because if the movement is due to relative density alone, the difference in density between the object and the medium around it, well, we know that the air becomes less dense as we go higher. So why are those balls and feathers not flying upwards? Anyway, we've been there a million times before. The next experiment is done by me. Um, I didn't invent it, um, but it's done in my old lab, and this is me doing it for you. So enjoy. So let's take a source of light, and in this instance, we're going to take the light traveling through the window. You'll notice that the light is traveling through a square piece of plastic, and it looks a little bit darker. And that's because this piece of plastic is what we call a polarizing filter. Now, at a basic level, what these filters do is they filter out photons that are not oscillating in a certain direction. Uh, for example, here, we can see that the photons oscillating in an up and down direction are going to be allowed through the filter. It is a little bit more complicated than that, but for now, this is a great analogy to start with. And that's why when you look through one of these filters, things look a little bit darker because a lot of the light has been filtered out. Now if I take a second filter and orientate it in the same way as the first filter, so the second filter will also allow photons traveling in the up and down direction to travel through it, then we're going to be able to see through both filters. But as you can see, if I turn that second filter through 90 degrees, no light at all can get through. And that's because the filters are now arranged like this. That second filter will only allow photons that are oscillating in that side-to-side -side direction through, but the photons that are oscillating in the side-to-side -side direction have already been filtered out by the first filter. So logic tells us that if I take a third filter and I place it in between the first two filters, no matter how I orientate that third filter, I should still get the same result no light passing through them. But that's not what we see. When we take this third filter and we change its orientation between the first two filters, we do get light passing through all three, almost as if the first filter has no impact on what happens at that final filter. And if you don't believe me, here's your proof. Now, this demonstration does seem to suggest that a photon doesn't have an intrinsic property which will determine whether or not it's able to pass through a particular filter. In fact, this is proven by the maths that we see in Bell's inequality, and I've linked a video for that in the description. Now, things get even weirder when, just like with the quantum eraser experiment, we produce entangled photons and pass them through different filters at different locations. But that's all going to be explained far better than I can explain it in the video I've linked in the description. So there you have it, Bell's inequality, and again, a video to the maths of that is linked in the description. Um, we just have time to show our final flat earth experiment. It's one we've all seen before. Um, and this is one that, yeah, really makes me wonder. So for a long time, I've been trying to make the analogy that if you take off a pair of shoes and back away from them, you will see them disappear eventually due to their angular size being too small to see. Correct, yes, that's correct, Amundo. And you can induce this effect by reducing the angle. So the angle of attack is essentially what causes things to disappear from bottom up. That is not correct, Amundo. Watch this nonsense. So in this example, I've set a book at the end of this very long hall, which they play table tennis on, so it's incredibly flat. Well, personally, I think you of all people need to read a book. And secondly, that floor's not flat. And as you can see, as I lower my angle, the book disappears. I hope you all feel a little bit dumber for having watched that. So in conclusion, the world of quantum physics is immensely fascinating. And the world of flat earth science is also fascinating. And I'll just leave it there. Thanks for watching.